Good morning, Michael, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come and talk to your team at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about advanced hemodynamics and maternal hypertension. And what's exciting about this is this is an opportunity to really change clinical practice. And over the last year or two, two the expansions in this field have been really dramatic. They've been dramatic because it's changing clinical care and producing results. To begin with, and I guess my sort of theme for this conversation is don't chase the BP. And maternal hypertension is defined by BP. So we know it's a common and serious condition. Management of blood pressure generally is ineffective, whether it's in maternal uh, circumstances, clinical environments, or in adult um, hypertension. The other thing is therapy is generally unclear and unsuccessful. Um, and outcomes poor, and importantly, hemodynamics are ignored. So it seems that we have a problem and we have a potential solution. And the proposal is don't put the cart before the horse. BP measures um, occur early uh, in hypertension uh, and are modulated by the ANS and are variable up until 25 weeks. So BP measures are difficult to de detect before 25 weeks. However, stroke volume, oxygen delivery and systemic vascular resistance changes are, occur at five weeks, and not 25 weeks as required for blood pressure. What we know too is therapy acts on the hemodynamics. So it acts on the stroke volume and the vascular function, the systemic vascular resistance, not the blood pressure specifically. So we need to have rapid measures of stroke volume, oxygen delivery, and systemic vascular resistance to treat maternal hypertension. The consequence, of course, of that is that early detection of hemodynamics allows for early intervention and improved results. The story begins at a very early stage, and I can't help but uh, appreciate the poetry of the inner canon of the Yellow Emperor in 85 AD, D, who said, the pulse is the palace of blood. It's governed by the heart and commanded by the chi, which is the vital energy. Is there a more poetic expression of the circulation? But it took... Um, until 1955, before Arthur Guyton put it in a much more sort of uh, contemporary format and said blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. But both of them agree in terms of their equation that blood pressure doesn't equal oxygen delivery. And oxygen delivery is the end function of the circulation. So cardiac output, stroke volume, and systemic vascular resistance are interdependent. They're compensatory variables, and they act in concert to maintain BP and oxygen delivery, but they are discrete. And what we do know is blood pressure is actually quite a poor measurement. And here's a uh, meta-analysis of 3,000 patients, um, comparison with invasive, with non-invasive standardised measures, and it shows that Systolic blood pressure is undermeasured by six millimetres of mercury and diastolic blood pressure overmeasured by six millimetres of mercury. So what that means is your pulse pressure is entirely erroneous and that our systolic blood pressure is measured um, lower than what the invasive blood pressure numbers are. What we also know about blood pressure and flow, of course, is that they are distinct and different and at different places within the circulation, the pressure flow waveforms and the um, uh, blood flow waveforms are entirely different. So where we measure and what we measure are distinct. Cardiac output doesn't equal blood pressure. Heart doesn't equal the vessels. And of course, flow doesn't equal pressure. So this sets the scene for us to better understand what we will discuss in the second half of this conversation. And that is, how do we measure flow to better understand pressure? What we also know, of course, is that at different points throughout this circulation, the systolic 
uh, and diastolic pressures actually change quite significantly. And this again was from Guyton. And we know that central blood pressure is quite different to brachial blood pressure. And uh, the further we go down the circulation, it varies. And the further we get down the circulation, the um, vascular variability under the control of the AMS also varies. So BP plus measures blood pressure of, at the aorta. And this is the measure that we should be taking to actually compare with central flow. Now, what's important about understanding blood pressure, of course, is that it's an autonomic uh, nervous system modulated um, parameter. So if we look at hypotension and hypertension and normotension, the relationship between the variables of stroke volume and systemic vascular, vascular resistance are quite different. If we look, and this is the important part of this, to the normotensive block, what we can see is that you can have a number of um, circumstances where there exists normotension, but quite deranged um, hemodynamics, which is the systemic vascular resistance and the systemic and the uh, um, stroke volume. And these are the compensated circulatory dysfunctions. And this is what happens in the early stages or the preclinical um, stages of hypertension and preeclampsia. And that is the circulatory abnormalities, whether they be stroke volume or systemic vascular resistance, are compensated by the autonomic nervous system to maintain the blood pressure according to the um, set points. The other thing that's actually really important about all this, of course, is that we do not have a therapy to address blood pressure. We have fluid inotropes and vasoactives to manage the cardiovascular system. And what we know is that uh, fluid ninotropes directly act on the stroke volume and vasoactives, of course, directly act on the systemic vascular resistance. The indirect or dotted lines there are the autonomic nervous system and they're based on um, baroreceptor chemoreceptor feedback. And so there is an interdependence. And in fact, both the systemic vascular resistance and the stroke volume regulate the blood pressure ultimately. But measuring directly what we're applying our therapy to makes the greatest sense in a therapeutic kind of uh, way. So what we've shown is that blood pressure is not necessarily an accurate measurement. Uh, what we're shown is that the therapies that we have don't actually act on the blood pressure. And yet our current guidelines are all defined by blood pressure. And what we're here to discuss today, is there a better approach? Can we look at hemodynamics and produce better outcomes and better results? What we do know, of course, is that both Guyton and the um, Imperial Canon understood hemodynamics. Unfortunately, that hasn't translated into practice. So if we start again at the, uh, the beginning, we know that oxygen is vital for life, especially in pregnancy. It supports the growing uh, fetus. And that an increasing oxygen demand to support normal rapid fetal growth requires an increase in oxygen supply. We also know that normal circulatory adaptation in pregnancy increases blood volume approximately 30%. What we also know is that the, the oxygen demand and the oxygen, uh, the oxygen um, demand and the oxygen supply uh, are, are meant to match. And that then matched by increasing the stroke volume, the cardiac output, the heart rate, SMII, and reducing the systemic vascular resistance. So this is a summary of the hemodynamic responses in early pregnancy. What we do know is that 85% of all hemodynamic adaptation is complete before 16 weeks. And yet the expression of um, hypertension, maternal hypertension, is defined by elevated blood pressure after 25 weeks. So this suggests that the hemodynamic changes offer, offer an opportunity for us to look at the circulation at an earlier stage and perhaps intervene earlier. Just to review the circulation, of course, the oxygen goes into the lungs, carried by the blood, pumped by the heart, through the vessels, through the microcirculation, and to the mitochondria. And it is absolutely critical 
that this um, is sustained and upregulated during pregnancy. If we look at the uh, true meaning of hemodynamics and hemo is blood and dynamics is flow, what we see is the red cells carrying the oxygen to the uh, relevant tissues. And so measuring this stroke volume, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance and oxygen delivery is likely to give us a much better understanding of the vitality or the oxygen delivery um, capabilities of the circulation. If we look at how the systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output uh, change and the blood pressure change over the duration of pregnancy, what we do see is that um, the blood pressure is modulated and generally um, maintained around a nor normal, normal level. What we can also see though is that the cardiac output jumps very early, the systemic vascular resistance diminishes very early and this is the means by which oxygen delivery is increased and blood pressure preserved. So there's a dissociation of the functional responsibilities of the circulation, which is delivering oxygen, and the blood pressure, which is preserving perfusion pressure. What's important is that we can access this important information in a very quick um, way. And uh, this is uh, an example of how we can access systemic vascular resistance in 30 seconds. And this is uh, um, thanks to Professor Herbert Valencise, who's done a lot of the seminal work in better understanding how hemodynamics um, provides insights, understandings, and therapeutic targets for uh, uh, patients with preeclampsia. So what we can see is put the transducer at the uh, um, base of the neck there, turned on the Doppler and it's auto traced and immediately gives us a readout of once you put the blood pressure reading in, um, gives us an automatic readout of systemic vascular resistance, stroke volume, cardiac output and heart rate. So within 30 seconds, you have the vital hemodynamic evidence that you need to understand the fundaments of the oxygen delivery system. Um, Vinny Agayam um, did this important bit of work and it describes the um, change in the systemic vascular resistance, the stroke volume and the cardiac output measured by the USCOM device um, over the gestational period. And you can see here, it's uh, uh, the first tranche of measures were done at uh, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, um, 28 weeks and 36 weeks. But what you can see is that there are curves associated with that and it varies during the, during the term of the pregnancy and probably varies within subjects too. As you can see, there's quite some distribution. So this is about precision medicine. Each circulation responds differently and understanding that and manage patient, managing patients throughout their uh, pregnancy involves serial measures. But what's important here is that the earliest changes are evidence at that 10 week period. So once you can measure the stroke volume, you can cal calculate many vital parameters, the systemic vascular resistance, oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. So this puts these um, parameters at the hands of the clinician within 30 seconds. There are many other um, variables such as cardiac power, um, flow times for fluid uh, balances, stroke work, um, cardiac power, etc. These are elastance, arterial elastance and compliance. These are parameters which may be important in both normal pregnancy and abnormal pregnancies. Um, the exciting thing is that we have all these mapped out, put into a, uh, a, um, um, a set of normative ranges, both maternal, pediatric and adults uh, in a variety of languages. So you just put in the numbers and you get out what the normal ranges are for these. Now in preeclampsia, and this is a, uh, a quite frontier part of science in um, 
in preeclampsia. It's, it's believed that the adaptation of the spiral arteries in the pregnancy, uh, in pregnancy are responsible for preeclampsia. And what this is, is that in a normal pregnancy, there is a much uh, uh, greater reservoir for blood interface and interchange. So the vascular resistance in normal pregnancy is reduced much more in those patients with slightly higher hypertension. So more resistance reduces stroke volume, cardiac output. This of course reduces less ox oxygen delivery and it puts more load on the heart, which is the SMI I measure. And ultimately it will be reflected in blood pressure, but that's after all the cascade of hemodynamic changes are implemented. So if we look at it simply, blood pressure in in the, in the normal environments, some of stroke volume, heart rate and systemic vascular resistance and oxygen demand equals oxygen delivery. In pregnancy, the normal pregnancy, stroke volume is increased, heart rate's increased, but systemic vascular resistance is reduced. So what we now get is an increased demand as the fetus starts to grow and an increase in oxygen supply. This is perfect. This is normal physiology. In hypertension, of course, this is different. And what we see here is high blood pressure, reduced stroke volume, and a doubly increased systemic vascular resistance. So this is vasogenic source of hypertension. And the source is vasoconstrictive physiology. And of course, what that means is the therapy is vasodilation. The consequence of vasogenic hypertension, of course, is increased demand, decreased oxygen delivery. And that's a problem. If we look at it from the other point of view, where you've got um, a hyperdynamic um, output, you've got a doubly increased stroke volume, you've got a reduced systemic vascular resistance, and again, you've got an increase in oxygen demand associated with normal pregnancy, and you've got a reduction in oxygen delivery. Again, an unfavorable environment for the developing fetus. And this is what happens if you represent that in a longitudinal sense. From birth, um, from conception all the way through, you see a normal drop in the systemic vascular resistance down to in the order of about seven to 800. If you look at the maternal hypertensive um, history, what you see is that the systemic vascular resistance remains much higher throughout the pregnancy and is really below that 1100 number. And this is what um, Herbert Valencisa and his team found. And that was that a systemic vascular resistance greater than 1,069 dynes per second per centimetre to minus five is associated with increased labour complications. Caesarean section, vaginal um, delivery for fetal distress, postpartum haemorrhage, uh, uterine atony, uh, atony and uh, NICU admission. So a high systemic vascular resistance has bad outcomes. And if you look at it, um, how do we treat that? One of the things that uh, Tira Longo and um, Herbert got to work on was to actually look at um, USCOM guided nitric oxide donor and volume expansion for two weeks at 30 weeks gestational age. So this is intervention for early signs of preeclampsia. And what you can see is it changed stroke volume. It increased stroke volume. It increased cardiac output and it decreased systemic vascular resistance as physiologically you would expect. It's a vasodilator. It reduces systemic vascular resistance. And uh, if you look at the um, um, parameters that were measured in that study, what's really interesting is stroke volume, cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance significantly responded, but blood pressure was unchanged, significantly unchanged. So blood pressure is an insensitive measure to changes in hemodynamics. Now the effect of therapy, again, Blood infusion raises stroke volume, cardiac output increases DO2 and autonomic nervous system reduces systemic vascular resistance. Fluid diuresis, you reduce the preload, stroke volume drops, cardiac output drops, 
um, oxygen delivery drops and systemic vascular resistance increases to try and maintain perfusion pressure. Inotropes, it's a lot more clear. You've got positive inotrope, increases stroke volume, increases cardiac output, increases oxygen delivery, and autonomically, the systemic vascular resistance drops. And conversely, with negative inotrope, um, drops stroke volume, drops cardiac output, drops uh, oxygen delivery, increases systemic vascular resistance. Vasodilators, um, vasodilator increases stroke volume, cardiac output, oxygen delivery by decreasing the systemic vascular resistance. And uh, a vasoconstrictor, of course, reduces systemic uh, stroke volume, cardiac output, oxygen delivery, and increases um, systemic vascular resistance. So these are the simulators of hypertension in pregnancy. Interestingly, that uh, the guidelines still maintain and are focused on defying the disease and the therapy by blood pressure. There are no measures yet in the guidelines, stroke volume, cardiac output, oxygen delivery and systemic vascular resistance. Even though physiologically, it explains the um, status of maternal hypertension and the therapy of therapeutic response to maternal hypertension, um, blood pressures remains the standard of care. Let's look at the alternative and think of how we might use it. Once you have stroke volume, you can look at the effects of fluid. Hypovolemia decreases stroke volume. Increasing um, preload increases the stroke volume. If we've got a baseline here, we look at the impacts of fluid. Baseline is hypovolemia. Uh, Mid-image mid there is euvolemia. And of course, um, the uh, final is the um, maintained output once you've passed the apex of the Frank Starling curve, which are the curves down below. Uh, again, with vasogenic pathology, we can vasoconstrict or we can vasodilate, and that moves the stroke volume up or down. You vasodilate, there's less resistance, the heart pumps at the same rate, then there will be more blood flowing out because there's less resistance. You vasoconstrict, and of course that resists the heart pumping, and so the heart has to pump harder to try and preserve output and the stroke volume is diminished. Um, cardiogenic negative and positive inotropes. A positive inotrope increases the contractility, increases the stroke volume. Baseline is 84. And if you do a negative inotrope, then the stroke volume diminishes. So these are very simple and can be very simple fundaments of physiology, and they can be understood by using the Frank Starling curve. Just to sort of tidy up at this discussion, um, this is three cases that we wrote about from Shandong Maternal uh, Centre. And uh, what we did in one afternoon was contiguously analyse three consecutive patients preparing for um, um, operation for the day after because of their hypertensive status. So C-sections in the morning, and these were the hemodynamic assessments before they went. There were three side-by-side -side patients, but who were all quite different. Um, number one uh, had um, normotension, um, and number two had mild hypertension, the map of 107, and the third patient had severe hypertension with a MAP of 118. Um, the, their their uh, clinical histories were slightly different and quite complicated. And really, I am only presenting these here to demonstrate that the um, hemodynamic appearances of these three consecutive cases are quite different and require and indicate a very specific targeted therapy. So the first case is normal, 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 normal for pregnancy, high stroke volume, low systemic vascular resistance and high oxygen delivery, high cardiac output. The smith madigan inotropy index with contractility is normal to high. And the heart rate, of course, is high at 94. Now, the mild cardiogenic hypertension, what you can see here is that the stroke volume is quite high. It's 90 mils 
The systemic vascular resistance is probably normal, low normal, uh, high normal. The oxygen delivery is high because the stroke volume is high. Cardiac output is high. Oxygen delivery is high. But the load on the heart, the smith madigan inotropy index, is quite high. And this is a worry. The heart rate also is normal to high. The third patient had severe vasogenic hypertension. And as you can see here, the stroke volume is 46, quite low, half almost the um, uh, other two. The systemic vascular resistance is twice, more than twice the normal for uh, systemic vascular resistance. And the oxygen delivery, and this is really critical, the oxygen delivery is nearly half of what is a normal range for a pregnancy, um, as is the cardiac output. smith madigan inotropy, of course, is low because the load on the heart is small, it's no resistance, and the heart rate is low. So three entirely different hemodynamic profiles here, and each of them requires an entirely different approach to therapy. And if you plot the blood pressure, the stroke volume, and the systemic vascular resistance, We've got the um, column one is normal. Column two is the first patient who was essentially normal. Column two, column three is the uh, mild um, hypertension. And then the column four is the severe vasogenic hypertension. And you can see that uh, stroke volume is much diminished in the severe case. smith madigan inotrope is quite uh, low in the um, severe um, vasogenic case. Uh, oxygen delivery is very low in patient number three uh, and very high in patient number two, which is the um, hy cardiogenic hypertension. Um, and in the normal case, uh, it matches normal ranges as expected. So three entirely different clinical profiles. And what we see there is that the blood pressure does not predict the severity of those um, diseases. Um, again, induce induction treatment is quite different between the three cases. And if this information had been known at say the uh, 10th week, then perhaps the interventions would have been much better targeted and the outcomes um, much, uh, much more favorable. So I, in summary, my, my points are quite simple, and that is don't put the horse before the cart. Take care of the horse and the jockey will follow. If you look after the stroke volume and the systemic vascular resistance, then the blood pressure will look after itself. So treat the SV, DO2 and systemic vascular resistance, BP will follow. The other thing that's absolutely becoming more critical is that because we can detect um, hemodynamic abnormalities at five to 11 weeks, the potential for a 10 week hemodynamic screening may allow us to identify maternal hypertension at 10 weeks and intervene at that period of time. And um, prior to the reset of the maternal baroreceptors um, during that period of uh, compensation or modulation where the autonomic nervous system preserves normal blood pressure, even though the hemodynamics are deranging continuously. So the message is, is 10 week hemodynamic screening the solution and uh, the outcome? Only maternal hemodynamics is going to tell us that information. So thank you very much for uh, um, allowing me this opportunity to discuss some of the evolving concepts associated with uh, maternal hemodynamics and advanced hemodynamics. Thank you very much.